where I'm coming from is a massive infection that almost killed me about two months ago, coupled with a broken femur and um, a few chronic wounds that I've been dealing with for several years. On the outside, my circumstances look like shit. I wouldn't wish them upon my worst enemy. It sort of lends a little bit more more credence to how what I'm talking about does not require any circumstances to look any certain way. You can do this literally from being broken and healing in your own bed. <laughs> why are we doing this? Like, why am I spending so much time being present? Now, this is the interesting part. I really want to get your thoughts on this because if we are creating the proper leverage, we need to have leverage, right? There needs to be a reason why we are learning to be fully present in the moment, in the now, the power of now as Eckhart Tolle said, right? Like this moment in time. And that reason has to do with unfolding and experiencing the greatest possible future that we can have in terms of you know, the real things that we care about, right? Our life experiences, our relationships, having love, having money in abundance, having adventures, having meaningful interactions, like all these things that we share as humans. Is it, is it okay to have those things that we want as levers for just being in the present moment right now? There's a part of me that's still confused around it, meaning like, well, no, that's just kind of, I can't really be present if I really want those things. Right. There's this kind of like fine dance between, well, okay, I'm going to be really present and I better get those things. I better get that money. Mm -hmm. I better get that new job. I better get that relationship and that love. How do you teach that to people? And how do you deal with the entanglement that happens with the desires to have things and have experiences and the wisdom of just being present? Yeah. So the ultimate fantastic question, question. Right? Yeah. fantastic question. It's a, it's an excellent question that I, I myself have had to struggle with a bunch and what, and I don't necessarily claim to have a full and complete answer, but I love this, this place of inquiry and examination. So really um, the question is to me is about, are we using that future vision of what's possible? Are we using it for motivation or are we putting demands on the future to say, if I don't get this, then it's not worth even trying. If I don't have this outcome, if I don't get the million dollars in my bank account by 2022 or 2023 or whatever, is it worth me trying? Right. Is it con- the- like making it conditional on the outcome? Making it conditional. That defeats the purpose of the practice of presence, which we've been taught by every great mystic is the essence of experiencing a great life, right? So I'm just curious. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So that's attachment. So that's that's basically saying, I'm not going to feel good unless I get the outcome that I want, which is the same as the kid saying, I'm not going to stop complaining unless I get the cookie in the cookie jar. I'm just going to keep whining and crying unless I get a cookie from the cookie jar. And so we're basically trying to work out agreements with the universe to say, if you give me what I want, then I'll do the work. But what we have to do is go, you know what, what I want, there's no guarantee that I'm going to get what I want. But I do know from enough life experience that if I'm not doing the work, there's no way I'm going to get what I want. So I have to let go of the attachment to actually getting that outcome and then go, I'm going to go for that direction. And in doing so, I'm going to get better at living in this process. I'm going to get better at showing up. I'm going to get better at bringing my presence through because I have something that I'm going for. Whether or not I get there is really ultimately somewhat irrelevant. It's just something that's motivating us to actually wake up in the morning and do the hard work of moving through the sloth and the grind and the, you know, the the sediment (laughs) of being a human being so that we actually can tap into a place of inspiration to keep wanting to evolve, keep wanting something greater. You know, my, I think my own ambitions come from um, really a sort of a humanitarian perspective. Like I really want to live with other fulfilled humans on this planet. I really want to live with other really interesting people who are doing what they're really good at doing and feel their joy of doing what they're really good at doing and feel my joy of doing what I'm really good at doing. And I see that we are living at a fraction of the capacity, most of us, that we could be living at. So it's that vision of that greater future that drives me. And I go, okay, well, if that's what I want for humanity, how do I need to do that myself? What are the things that I need to do myself to be living at that 
future vision for humanity. Beautiful. I, I love it. You know, the conversation just sparked so many different, you know, avenues, you know, the way that I've learned to deal with it is that, yes, it's really beneficial to create an exciting future vision for yourself, right? Like, let's get really clear as much as we can. Let's do the work to visualize what this life could look like when it's freaking amazing, like optimal, like everything happens that you could dream of and more, right? And then you cut the attachment and you just do the work of being present. And I think a lot of it comes down to this notion of trust, this notion of surrender, right? Yeah. This kind of quality of trusting that there's a plan for this universe, for this unfolding that is beyond what we can cognitively or intellectually understand. What are your thoughts around this, these, this concept of trust or surrender, or, you know, this, this idea that there's this much greater force behind us, um, you know, that is kind of pulsating energy, pulsating the movement of the cosmos that we're just a part of. How do you hold yeah, that? Well, it's more than an idea. It is what is, it is what's animating all of life. Um, I'm sure it's probably some of the people listening right now have read uh, The Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. It's a very popular book or his Art of Surrender. And it's all about this topic. And, you know, we have, or we have the word surrender gets a bad rap in this culture because people either associate it with giving up, which true surrender is not giving up at all. It's letting go. It's going, oh, I, I, I there's this construct of my imagination that I'm used to thinking about myself through is not going to be adequate to be able to move me in the direction of a future vision. So I have to let go of all of that construct and actually surrender to this creative intelligence, however you want to call it, source, God, the universe, whatever it is, there's a movement of energy that is always present inside each one of us. And we have simply cut off our awareness to it. But if you can befriend that energy, if you can become one with that energy, this is what true yoga really is all about. It's not about stretching. It's about befriending and becoming one with that energy. It's uh, uh, Yoga means unity, union, Become, developing a union between what you perceive to be your individual self and what you perceive to be other and making it all part of an energetic flow. That to me that's my motivator because that feels really fun. That feels, that can feel blissful at times to be in that space of really just, I think most people only have a tiny fraction of the experience of how blissful life can really be when you really surrender into the energy that's already present deep down inside of you. And so practicing befriending that energy, practicing it through whatever means, breath work, qigong, tai chi, yoga, to awaken that latent power is that's where it's at. That's where it's at, brother. And also before I have a couple more questions for you, man, we, you and I can just go on forever, obviously. I just want to just really quick pop in because, you know, when we met just a, just a couple of short, short weeks ago, I mean, you're in the middle of a pretty big health deal right now, right? I mean, you're mm-hmm. on bed rest right now. I mean, you are doing this interview with me on how many days have you been on bed rest right now? Close to 70. So 70 days, you've really been kind of uh, immobile, just, you know. Been yeah, on- I, yeah, my wheelchair has been out in my garage. Uh, I went from being hospitalized for over a month to being sent home and uh, on bed rest at home. So I literally haven't uh, gotten out of bed for 70 days. Okay. So, yeah. so I'm, I'm, I pop in because it's, it's so inspiring to see how much juice and creativity and life flows from you, just a testament to the work that you've done for all these years. Okay. And so I just wanted everyone that's listening to know that in this moment, this brother has been, you know, in a pretty tough situation for 70 years. <laughs> yeah, I'll say I mean, not, to, not to like poke yeah. at it, but you know, this is no, just- it's true. Uh, no, I think it's worth mentioning because, you know, this is exactly what we're talking about. Yeah. It's kind of the, the question is always, okay, well, if someone has a really good perspective, then where are they coming from? What's, what's helped them to have that great perspective? Where I'm coming from is a massive infection that almost killed me about two months ago, and um, coupled with a broken femur and um, a few chronic wounds that I've been dealing with for several years. And so um, on the outside, my circumstances look like shit. I wouldn't wish them upon my worst enemy. So it sort of lends a little bit more, more credence to how what I'm talking about does not require any circumstances to look any certain way. You can do this literally from being broken and healing in your own bed. 